Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, to the webinar titled Russian Disinformation and War in Ukraine, How to Become Immune to Propaganda. This uh, webinar is organized within the grant entitled uh, Polish Experience in Combating Disinformation Inspirations uh, for the Western Balkans, which is the public task financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland within the grant competition Public Diplomacy 2023. We are honored to have a panel of distinguished experts who specialize in Russian disinformation, security issues in Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Our panelists include Professor Konrad Pawłowski, who heads the Balkan, Balkan Department at the Institute of Central Europe in Lublin and serves as an assistant professor at the Maria Curie Skurowska University, also in Lublin. Uh, Dr. Jakub Polkowski, who heads the Eastern Department uh, at the Institute of Central Europe in Lublin, and uh, he is an assistant professor at Maria Curie Skorowska University, also in Lublin. And Dr. Andrzej Szapaciuk, uh, a senior analyst in the Eastern Department of the Institute of Central Europe in Lublin, and assistant professor at the Catholic University of Lublin. And I am Tomasz Stępniewski, the Deputy Director of the Institute of Central Europe and uh, an Assistant Professor uh, at the Catholic University of Lublin. And I will be moderating this uh, panel. So uh, the webinar will contain two rounds of questions. Uh, without further delay, uh, let's proceed to the first set of questions. And uh, we will begin with a question directed to Dr. Jakub Polkowski. Could you please provide an overview of this year's uh, developments in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, particularly focusing on the lens of Russian disinformation? This war is not uh, confined to be battlefield, but extends to the information warfare. Could you elaborate uh, on the tactics employed uh, by Russia in the information war and their effectiveness? How do these uh, tactics uh, compare to those utilized during the era of the Soviet Union? So the floor is yours. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, well, in fact, just like you said, uh, uh, if we talk about uh, this war, uh, the war of Russia against Ukraine, uh, we can see that this war exemplifies very, very perfectly an evolution of, uh, of warfare in, in the 21st century. Because we can see that in the 21st century, which is called sometimes an information era, uh, information or disinformation or propaganda is, uh, is just another tool of, uh, of, of war. It's, it's just another weapon, uh, in fact, and this, this conflict shows that uh, uh, perfectly. In a broader sense, it is sometimes said now uh, that information and disinformation uh, is not only just another battlefield. Uh, it is only a part of uh, of an ongoing new Cold War because it's it is very broad. It's not only it doesn't only refer to uh, Russo-Ukrainian uh, uh, war. Uh, what is also uh, I think that we we also should remark that uh, some people say there is a symmetry. Uh, everyone, because they say everyone uses uh, propaganda and disinformation, lies, fake news, and so on uh, in politics not only Russia, so why do we focus on, on, on Russian uh, propaganda, on Russian uh, disinformation? Um, well, we focus on Russia because there is no symmetry, in fact. Uh, of course, everyone uses propaganda, misinformation, etc. in politics. It is enough to take a look at every uh, election campaign, and, and we can see that. But there is a, a, a basic difference, because totalitarian or authoritarian states like Russia has um, they have one important advantage they control infosphere and they control the flow of information uh, we don't we don't uh, democratic states have uh, uh, well this is a uh, uh, you know uh, one of the most important values of democracy we have freedom of speech we have freedom of conscience etc uh, etc et they don't. Russia or China don't have anything like this, so they are more, much more efficient when it comes to to uh, using propaganda or disinformation as a tool of, as a weapon, as a tool of, of war. So, um, what do they do? Uh, I mean, I mean, the Russians. Uh, uh, well, they are they are very good for, for a couple of reasons. Because, firstly, 
they have uh, uh, a lot of experience in using such uh, instruments. Uh, I would say uh, centuries long experience, but they also have uh, know-how. They exactly know how to do this because they have been doing it for, as I said, for, for, for centuries. And also they now they have money. I mean, they spend a lot of money for disinformation, for uh, for media outlets like RT, Sputnik, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we we are talking about billions uh, of dollars. This is a, a, a lot of money. Uh, what is also important, especially in the twenty first century, uh, the traditional media outlets, V like uh, printed press, um, they decline everywhere, not only in Russia. So uh, this is why. Um, social media, internet, uh, uh, blogs, etc. They uh, they become more and more important, and Russians, uh, Russia also also uses uh, very efficiently, very broadly, uh, uses these uh, uh, these instruments, and this is of course uh, used both domestically and abroad. Domestic propaganda, uh, well, the Russians are very indoctrinated actually for generations and uh, this is why this is one of the reasons why the russian society is so passive also uh, uh, domestically the russian uh, information machine uh, propaganda machine is uh, is focused on historical narratives explaining or justifying any politics any uh, uh, any aggression of russia of course it's not an aggression in this uh, Russian historical narrative, it's uh, it's not it's not an aggression. What uh, is more important for us, for our point of view, is of course this Russian propaganda addressed abroad, externally, because it touches us, the West or, or, or Ukraine. Um, so uh, from the very beginning of this uh, of this invasion, Russians try to firstly break Ukrainians' morale. They, they, they use all instruments and uh, all this fake news and propaganda to break Ukrainians' morale. So far, they are not very successful about it. Uh, Ukrainian nation uh, appeared to be quite, uh, quite resistant to these uh, to this Russian activities. It is unfortunately a bit different when it comes to the West, including Poland. Um, it is because, uh, as I said before, Russia has a lot of experience in influencing uh, Western societies. Uh, so they promote a vision of Russia who is not guilty. It's Ukraine who is guilty of this war, and of course the West. The Russians, uh, Russian, and before uh, the Soviet propaganda, referring to your question, uh, there is no difference, no big difference between Soviet propaganda and Russian propaganda, except for one technological difference. Now they have much more possibilities than, than during the Soviet era. And secondly, in the Soviet era, uh, they supported radical movements in the West, political radical movements, but they were mostly left-wing. The difference is that now they support mostly right-wing movements and political parties in the West, because usually uh, political or especially uh, far-right political uh, movements in the West are anti-American, anti-European Union, uh, uh, quite often pro-Russian or pro-Putin, uh, at least. Uh, and, of course, they um, there are many uh, different people, many weirdos in this movement who believe in all conspiracy theories, etc., etc. And these conspiracy theories are also supported and popularized by all this Russian, uh, Russian machine. And also, we have to realize that uh, sometimes we don't know that they are Russian. That it, is, it is Russian who stands behind this. Uh, for instance, in Poland, because in Poland it is extremely difficult to say uh, hello, Russia is good, I'm pro-Russian, and Putin is is nice. Um, in Poland, it is it is not a good way to to be successful. So they pretend they are not pro-Russian. They use uh, so they use anti-Ukrainian presentiment, which is quite which is present in Polish society. They claim they are Polish patriots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is uh, an old, old mechanism. Um, this means that this Russian disinformation is very well tailored. It depends on target. 
instruments, the message uh, depends on a target. So the Polish society gets from this Russian machine different things than the German society or the French society or or, or the Ukrainian society. Um, and how did it change? Uh, I mean, this Russian disinformation during this period of uh, since the February of 2022. Uh, well, it is evolving, of course, and uh, they adapt the message to the changing realities, to the changing circumstances. And so, for example, at the beginning of this invasion, we heard a lot uh, about Russian power. It's just the beginning. We we haven't even begun yet. We will show you. We will show you we are very strong. Then, well, it was obvious for everyone that Russia is not strong. So they, they changed this, uh, the, this narrative. And uh, today they say it's not us who is guilty. Russia is not aggressive. Russia was never aggressive. Russia has never invaded anyone. Russia just defends. Defends from the Nazis. From, from the Nazis in Ukraine and for, from the West, from NATO, etc., etc. And all this reference to Nazi to fascism is, is, is not a coincidence because uh, it is brilliantly uh, coherent with domestic Russian propaganda. Because domestic Russian propaganda refers to World War II, the Great Patriotic uh, War, and to the fight against Nazism and the fascism. In other words, today's Russians quite often believe that Again, just like their grandparents, they fight Nazis and they fight fascism. The NATO and Ukraine is, is Nazi and, and fascist. And this is constant. Uh, some tactics, some uh, narratives, uh, they change. They change. Uh, uh, for example, some time ago, a year ago, more or less, we heard a lot about American biolabs producing Ukrainian mutant soldiers uh, and so on. This was, of course, ridiculous, but it was quite popular for some time. Uh, now, take a look. We don't we don't hear any more about biolabs. We hear about uh, the Nazis, more or more or less, because, uh, as I said, some tactics change, but our strategy doesn't change. The Russian disinformation strategy in this uh, uh, in this war. Uh, one more thing. I think the one last thing, but it's also very important. Uh, Russian disinformation works differently when it comes to um, Ukraine and Ukrainian society, differently when it comes to the West and the Western societies. And there is another direction, another target, the global South, South America, Asia, Africa. And uh, this um, direction is different because uh, Russian disinformation uh, stresses a few things that are very I know vivid in this uh, southern societies. Anti-Americanism, anti-imperialism, which means they are anti-Western because they remember about the colonialism and so on and so on. And the Russians, uh, you know, underline, we are good. We always, we always helped you uh, during the era of colonialism and, uh, and so on. And now also look at this West, look at this imperial West. Uh, they want to uh, starve you because, of course, all this uh, food crisis uh, caused by a Russian blockade of the Black Sea uh, in the Russian propaganda is, is of course, was, was caused by Ukraine and the West. So we are good. The West is bad. This is the message to the global, global South. Unfortunately, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's quite effective. Thank you very much, uh, Kuba, uh, for your very interesting uh, speech about Russia's uh, disinformation. And uh, now let's move to uh, Dr. Andrzej Szabaciuk uh, with a question concerning Belarus and President Alexander Lukashenko's regime, which uh, extends support to Russia in its confrontation with Ukraine. So could you uh, shed the light on how Belarus contributes uh, to Russian propaganda efforts are there visible differences between Belarusian and Russian propaganda strategies? If so, what methods uh, are employed by President Alexander Lukashenko? So, Dr. Shabachuk, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for invitation. I think 
Uh, from the beginning of this full-scale Russian aggression, we see that Alexander Lukashenko and the Belarusian state media uh, supporting Russia and showing that the West started this war, not Ukraine was only the puppet uh, in the hand of the West, and the West started the war. And and at the beginning of uh, of this uh, full-scale aggression, I remember uh, one of the speech of Alexander Lukashenko who who said that Ukraine must free itself from overseas protectors and um, start uh, peace talks with Russia and accept Russia's conditions. Uh, I think it's here also uh, at the moment. Uh, now, uh, Belarusian and Russian propaganda also emphasize that we must start uh, peace negotiation because supporting Ukraine is meaningless. Ukraine will never win this war. And we will have more that civilians and Ukraine will be more destroyed. It will be only only uh, effect of this of this politics. But what, what is interesting in this uh, Belarusian state propaganda, we, we see that Lukashenko is this person who who can deal with any problem, not only in Belarus, but also in region. Sometimes even is uh, more effective than Vladimir Putin. Uh, we remember this Prigozhin uh, cup. And uh, this negotiation with Prigozhin, we know that Prigozhin is already uh, dead, but uh, during this cup, this uh, march on, on Moscow, uh, Lukashenko was the person who deal with uh, the issue. Putin uh, was unable to uh, resolve this problem. And also uh, in the state media, we, we can find a lot of information how Lukashenko wants to st stop this war. Uh, how Lukashenko calls U Ukrainians to start peace negotiation. Uh, Lukashenko also shows that uh, he, he was the, 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 this person who uh, initiated uh, Minsk agreements. And, uh, but the Minsk agreement was a uh, good idea, but unfortunately, as he said, uh, Western partners used this uh, negotiation to uh, gain some time which was needed to prepare Ukraine for uh, aggression against, uh, against Russia. Also, in, in this uh, narrative of Belarusian propaganda, you can find that this uh, fraud elections uh, from 2020 was uh, the main goal of this Belarusian opposition was was to start uh, second Maidan in in Minsk, and the effect of this Maidan will will be war, could be war uh, in Belarus. So Belarusian propaganda tried to show that uh, the person who prevent the war in Belarus was was Alexander Lukashenko because this repression against uh, democratic opposition uh, stopped the process of destabilization of uh, Belarus and thanks thanks that we don't have similar situation like like in Ukraine so uh, that's why Belarus must uh, at the moment stand together with Russia and protect Russia from aggressive west uh, aggressive Poland uh, Baltic states uh, because uh, these uh, neighbors uh, are uh, preparing for uh, ag aggression and they want to occupy Western territories of Belarus. So uh, I think this nar narrative is very, very, very strong, very popular in uh, Belarusian propaganda. Also, uh, it, it, it helps to uh, Lukashenko uh, explain why why he, he don't want to send uh, Belarusian troops to Ukraine because he must protect Belarus from Poland from NATO and uh, in Poland now American special services uh, training uh, partisans uh, this partisan will be used in Belarus to start uh, revolution to to change legally elected author uh, authorities uh, as Lukashenko said so. The Poland is also, uh, I think, one of the uh, most uh, important element uh, uh, of uh, this uh, Belarusian propaganda narrative because Poland and uh, the United States are show are shown shows as as the main enemies, especially Poland. Polish authorities and reform of our army is often uh, show as example of aggressive Polish uh, plans. Uh, there are also kind of uh, uh, protests near Polish consulates in Belarus. During this protest, local uh, citizens try to protest against Polish aggressive poli uh, politics in the region. 
so uh, everything is uh, well prepared by the Belarusian uh, authorities and they want to show uh, to Belarusian society that we are under uh, under threat from from the west and you must stay together with Lukashenko stay together with Russia and wait for the end of the of this war because this this war will end and for sure Russia Russia will win this war if you talk about uh, situation on Polish Belarusian border uh Belarusian propaganda uh, try to show this, this 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 crisis as a as a fault of Poland uh, first of all uh, because Poland was involved in intervention uh, in the Middle East uh, and this this destabilized this region and after after this intervention a lot of people simply uh, try to migrate and looking for a uh, safe uh, safe place to live and Belarus simply uh, providing them uh, aid, they 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 don't want to stop these people from uh, crossing the, the border because Lukashenko said that they will not uh, pay for stopping migrants anymore. Uh, in, in May two thousand twenty one, they try to create kind of image that we are not involved in this process of smuggling migrant refugees through Polish Belarusian border, uh, and. Uh, all uh, pictures, all uh, movies uh, with uh, Belarusian border service uh, are only show how they help uh, people uh, in need uh, on the border, providing food, uh, providing uh, medical assistance. Uh, there is no uh, other kind of involvement of Belarusian state in, in this crisis. Very, very often in this uh, Belarusian propaganda, uh, uh, we can meet kind of a specific narrative about uh, uh, connection with Russia. Belarusian and Russian, it's it's one nation. Uh, and uh, Lukashenko even said, uh, Belarusian nation is the, it's Russia, Russian nation, but with uh, quality mark. So they are a little bit better, a little bit better Russians than ordinary Russians. Well, uh, better organized. They live in better than Russians. Uh, situation in Belarus is a little bit better than, for example, in in the territory of the Russian Federation. So uh, they, they they try to create kind of uh, narrative that uh, thanks Lukashenko we live in a safe state without war, without uh, unpredictable situation, and uh, Lukashenko is the person who will uh, who will protect Belarus uh, and not not. Uh, uh, allowed to uh, involve Belarus in uh, in a war or uh, always stop any 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 person who uh, wants to involve Be uh, Belarus in a war uh, with the West or uh, in Ukraine. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Andrzej, uh, for uh, your perspective on uh, Belarus disinformation. And finally, we address uh, Professor Konrad Pawłowski with regards to the Balkan states and Russian influence. Could you outline how Russia uh, seeks to exploit uh, the Ukrainian situation to influence the Balkan states, uh, particularly Serbia? Uh, in terms of disinformation efforts in the Balkans, does Russia demonstrate effectiveness? Given your recent interactions with uh, analysts in the Balkans, uh, we are interested in your uh, insights. So the floor is yours, Professor Pawlowski. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me say that Russian propaganda uh, towards Balkan states is not particularly original in that sense. This is, this is of course, tailor-made propaganda addressed to every particular society, every particular state. And uh, so if you compare those narratives addressed to, to Bulgaria or North Macedonia, they can be contradictory. But this is not the, the, the problem, actually. The, 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 because the goal is different. It's not about supporting particular states or societies or the part of societies or some concept, let's say political concept. The goal is is different. Or actually, there are uh, different goals of those disinformation practices. And in my opinion, it would be uh, the first and the main probably it would be to, to win the ideological war with the West over the Balkans, over the hearts and minds of the Balkan people. And actually, to some extent, uh, Balkans are easy targets, particularly Serbia, but also Rep Republic of Serbska in Bosnia-Herzegovina or the North Kosovo. 
I mean, the Serbian population of the North Kosovo. So to create this, I mean, to, to win the ideological war, to exploit the anger, or maybe to use the anger as the political mechanism, to destabilize the actions taken by, by the West, to stabilize the Balkans after the, the wars of the from the 90s. So to destabilize the region, to keep it as a gray zone between the West and the East, the part of the Europe which is not completely integrated with the uh, with the European or Euro-Atlantic mainstream, to keep it as a part of Russian sphere of influence. And it's not it's not particularly original. It's nothing new. Russia always wanted to be a part of this, let's say, geopolitical games in the Balkans. And uh, in my opinion, it's also, it, does, it is also not that much effective. And uh, so what Russia really can do in the Balkans is, is probably to, to create some kind of conflicts or kind of problems from the Western perspective, but they cannot strategically change the course uh, of the political processes in the region. But still, we should be uh, familiar with this existence of this propaganda disinformation because it's of course, against the, the interest of, of the European countries and, in my opinion, against the interest of Balkan people as well. So uh, to create, uh, to use the anger to create the divisions between, not only between states, but also between uh, particular parts of the society. I mean, uh, keep in mind the diversity, uh, cultural, ethnic diversity of the, the Balkan states, it's easy to... Uh, to find those, let's say, disputes, conflicts, divisions, and try to to exploit them as as a political tool for the destabilization. And this is what Russia is doing, actually, uh, almost in every country in, in the region. And uh, what more? To create some doubts, to exploit some historical questions, discussions. Uh, to support some radical movement, uh, support some radicalization of the public discussion, to support or to, to use or exploit the polarization, or maybe just to create the polarization of society. So, uh, in Serbia, we, we can see that Russia is supporting actually the most radical anti-Western, anti-European part of the society. And narrative is quite Quite simple that uh, this part is the, the the only one patriotic part of the Serbian society. So to to create the polarization, to exploit the polarization, to attract these extremist groups, both from the let's say left wing or from the right wing, it doesn't matter because this Russian narrative can be of course nationalistic or, or very say, radi radical in in that in that sense, but also they support anti-capitalist movement and uh, so extreme leftist movement, uh, some just anti-movement like anti-LGBT, anti-European. So something which is extreme, it's definitely supported by Russia because the aim is to create some kind of some kind of problem, some kind of divisions, and then uh, strategically to keep the Balkans how they are. I mean, to keep the status quo, status quo, which 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 is not delivering what people in the Balkans really uh, look look for. I mean, the stabilization, economic development, which is connected with, with the European integration, but keep the situation how it is and keep some kind of Russian presence in the region. But um, maybe maybe just, just a kind of change, observation from my perspective. Uh, two weeks ago, I have been to Ohrid in North Macedonia, and I was trying, I mean, I was buying the T-shirt of Alexander the Great, and uh, the gentleman who was selling the T-shirt, he was also um, selling the um, other T-shirts, like uh, with, with other historical people, and of course, T-shirts with Putin. And this is nothing new in the Balkans. You can easily, uh, in Montenegro, you can buy the, the magnets with Putin, with the, with the picture of Putin, which is a kind of uh, disappointment for me, but this is how it is. And uh, so we, we started discussion about those T-shirts, and I, I openly asked, "Why do you why do you sell the T-shirt with Mr. Putin?" Uh, I mean, he's a war criminal. And uh, little by little, like we started this discussion, and I saw that this gentleman, a young, probably student uh, from from Macedonia, he he is actually supporting Putin. And I asked him, "Why do you support this this policy? Why do you support this this president?" 
And he said, because I'm an anti-Western, because I actually I hate this Western capitalism and things like that. And, and he said some, let's say, original ideas about the NATO. I was surprised because Macedonia, North Macedonia became a, a, new, a member of NATO in 2020. And uh, so NATO is actually stabilizing the, the, the country and the region. Uh, and it's definitely the, the, the factor of stabilization in the Balkans these days, especially when you think about the North Kosovo. And so he was completely, uh, I mean, his ideas were completely against what, what I thought about young people in the Balkans. I, I thought that maybe they can be more, let's say, uh, or, or more pro-European or well-informed. But this is a new generation of people, and we sometimes don't see this. We don't see what is coming. I mean, this new generation, which is disappointed by the old order, old world, uh, disappointed by the promises uh, from European Union about the perspectives of integration. If you keep in mind that the fact that Macedonia was waiting 17 years just to start the negotiations, I mean, literally from 2000 five until 2022 and it's still not actually it's still not negotiating because of the bulgarian veto so we can see that russia is also uh ex exploiting these weak points from from the western policy so it's it's it's, it's clearly visible that we are looking for the weak points of, of the western policy so in serbia it would be the nato intervention over kosovo everybody understands the, the context this is a big trauma big big tragedy from the serbian perspective and uh, so russia is trying to 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 use this anti-nato anti-capitalist anti-american uh, narrative uh, everywhere in the Balkans, including Macedonia, what we what we saw, see from this example. So, if I think uh, in Serbia, in particular, actually this situation is more complex than we think it is. Actually, uh, although some media is presenting uh, Serbia's foreign policy as a pro-Russian, especially these days, that Serbia is actually uh, supporting uh, Russia, it's not that it's not that simple. Serbia is trying to to balance. If Serbia is trying to implement this multi-vector foreign policy, which is not probably that much effective as I think it is, but it's, it's not that much pro-Russian polit politician as some people think he is. Actually, he's pragmatic. He's more like uh, pro-European, uh, even pro-American to some extent. And of course, he wants to have these good relations with Russia and China, but he's completely familiar with the economic facts. And the fact is that the more than 60% of the Serbia's uh, trade is, uh, this is the trade with European Union. So uh, in Serbia, this is this is complicated because the, the Serbian society is pro-Russian. So that's, uh, although it's a little bit uh, idealistic perspective uh, of Russia, uh, they, they have, or they, they share actually, um, but for the years, Putin was one of the most popular politicians in Serbia. So you cannot ignore that fact. So Vucic's uh, policy, I mean, this balancing is also based on the fact that Serbian society is pro-Russian. And so it changes actually the, the way how Serbia is implementing its, its foreign policy. And it, so it's not, it's not clear, but I believe that from the Russian perspective, President Vucic is a kind of a kind of problem to some extent. Of course, he's he's delivering uh, some pro-Russian perspective of Serbian foreign policy, or he's also supporting this pro-Russian vector of Serbian foreign policy. But this is not the only one vector. And there were some rumors for, for the years. There were some rumors that Russia would be uh, in, interested in replacing Vucic with some truly pro-Russian politicians, and uh, because there are some politicians like that in Serbia who are really pro-Russian, anti-European, but uh, which is too strong for, for, for that. And this is also the reason why Western countries supporting President Vucic, because he's first he's the stabilizing factor in the Balkans. And uh, the sec second, he can be replaced by some pro-Russian politicians who can really change the course of the Serbian foreign policy. So this is the the challenge, this is the danger, and that's why Vucic still has this support from 
Western Western countries. This is this is complex uh, situation, but uh, I believe that this balancing uh, of Serbia is is actually uh, more or less pro-European. Although he is criticized for some reason about his cause, about uh, this kind of disputable no, neutral position towards towards the situation in the East, but. President Vucic clearly said many times that he's supporting the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And uh, there were some uh, information that Serbia is selling weaponry to, to Ukraine, not directly, but still. Uh, so I believe that it is against the interest of Russia, but Russia is not criticizing Serbia that much because Russia wants to keep Serbia as, as a kind of symbol, as a kind of country who is still a, a a friend of Russia, because Russia needs this kind of message for Russian society to, to show some countries, uh, in, of course, Serbia, but also Rep Republika Serbska and Bosnia Herzegovina, to show those countries as a, as a kind of friends and supporters of Russian policy uh, in general, but also in, uh, in, in the Ukrainian context. So I would stop here, but but there are many different uh, different. Uh, no perspectives here. So I will stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Konrad, uh, for your uh, opinion about uh, Serbia and uh, in a wider perspective on Balkans uh, uh, role in Russia's disinformation propaganda. And now uh, let's proceed to the second round of questions. And this uh, round is a shorter one. So I, I now I pose a joint question to uh, Dr. Jakub Polkowski and uh, Dr. Andrzej Szabaciu. Could you collaboratively outline the potential tra trajectory of the situation in Ukraine, uh, considering the perspective of both Russian and Belarusian disinformation? What are Russia's uh, current objectives uh, and, uh, uh, within the context uh, of the Ukraine situation? And might we anticipate any shifts in these objectives? Additionally, how equipped is Ukraine to counter the influence of Russian and Belarusian disinformation? So, uh, Dr. Olkowski, could you start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think the answer will be quite short because uh, this question is is not very complicated. Um, um, actually, uh, Russia's leadership knows perfectly that Russia is not going to win this war militarily, uh, and they also they also realize that internal situation in Russia, I mean, uh, social situation is unstable. And an economic situation is Russia in Russia is getting worse. However, at the same time, they realize that Ukraine has also a lot of problems, uh, internal problems, uh, um, social, economic, political, etc. Uh, and they know that Ukraine is not able to win and is not going to win this war without a constant and substantial support from the West. So uh, the goals of the Russian, of the Russia in general, and in particular uh, the Russian disinformation propaganda, uh, is quite simple. There are a few objectives. Um, one, uh, the Western states and nations are tired off with uh, supporting and helping Ukraine. This is objective number one. Then there is objective uh, number two. This uh, um, long and bloody war of attrition is still ongoing because it's the Ukraine and the Ukrainians who don't want peace. This is objective number two, you know, to, to convince us, to convince the West that it's the Ukraine who doesn't want peace. Uh, as a result, we have another objective. The West should coerce Ukraine into some negotiation or some uh, peace talks, uh, etc., and uh, Russia will get what he, what it wants because Russia needs some break. Russia needs some agreement, some uh, peace agreement. So this agreement would be very un, uh, very bad for, for for Ukraine because it would uh, weaken Ukraine additionally in, internally. Uh, uh, it would deepen uh, internal Ukrainian political divisions. 
Mm, and at the same time, it would give such an agreement. Uh, it would give uh, uh, time to, to Russians to recover and to reinforce and in some time begin again to, to, you know, to finish off Ukraine. Uh, so this is what Russian propaganda will try to do in uh, in some time, and I think it's not going to change because this year uh, and next year uh, are election years in many when, when many many Western states. To, so the Russian propaganda will try to convince us and to convince uh, societies in the West that it doesn't make sense uh, to support Ukraine anymore. This is a, a larger political and strategic, strategic uh, goal of, uh, of the Russian propaganda, and I don't think it's, it's going to, to change. I think that uh, it will be uh, intensified in, uh, in, in the upcoming months. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Andrzej Szabaciuk? Uh... If I can add, add a few things uh, to uh, Dr. Jakub uh, uh talk, I think um, also Russia was Russia is is willing to show that if we will uh, continue uh, support Ukraine, uh, this war uh, could escalate. This war could escalate, and uh, the Western state could be directly involved in this war. Uh, I know that in Russia propaganda there is kind of narrative that already <clears throat> NATO is involved in this war, but. I mean that uh, Russia can use uh, a nuclear weapon that uh, uh, can start attack uh, targets in the territory of the NATO states. Uh, so it's also uh, they they also try to uh, threat uh, uh, Western societies that prolonged war is very danger. And also can uh, lead to global problems with uh, with food uh, supply, especially in uh, Africa and uh, Asia, uh, because uh, Ukraine uh, don't want to uh, start uh, peace negotiation. It and it's only uh, fault of Ukraine and and West uh, who stand behind uh, the Ukrainian authorities. Uh, we we are willing to start negotiation. We are willing to start. Uh, to uh, finish this this war, to end this war, uh, but uh, there is no kind of uh, goodwill uh, on the side of uh, collective West and, and Ukraine. Ukrainians want to uh, carry on this uh, war because they uh, get support, get money, get get new weapon, and uh, it's from the point of view uh, Ukrainians, it's, it's good to carry on this this war. Uh, Russia tried to show that kind of uh, image to to Western societies, and I think unfortunately that there is a lot of people who believe in this uh, in this propaganda, and uh, and also in Ukraine the number of people who are tired uh, with this war is 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 growing and. And now it's a problem because uh, Ukraine must uh, recruit a, a new part of uh, soldiers. Uh, uh, they need them uh, on the front line. The same situation is Russia. Russia is also preparing probably a new wave of mobilization. So uh, unfortunately, I don't see any, uh, any hope uh, for a quick uh, end of this war. This war will be long and really uh, bloody. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, from your perspective, uh, the scenario is r rather mm, pessimistic. So, and uh, what about uh, uh, Professor Konrad Pawłowski and uh, the perspective from, the, I mean, Balkans' perspective on this ongoing conflict? Uh... Actually, of course, this is this is the question. I mean, uh, officially, all all the Balkan uh, states supporting more or less supporting the the Ukraine, of course, supporting Ukraine and supporting European perspective. But there are some nuances. Let's say Serbia is the only one European country who is not uh, who is not implementing, which is not implementing the sanctions against Russia. Uh, so this this state has different uh, stance, let's say, and uh, in a way it relates to Bosnia Herzegovina because of Repub Republika Serbska is blocking more decisive actions. But officially Bosnia uh, participated 
in this European sanctions against Russia. And uh, But the perspective, of course, it's different. And so officially, those states are supporting uh, Ukraine. But uh, if you if you take take a look into the perspective of societies, it can be different because there are some you know parts of the society who are more or less let's say pro-Russian or maybe they don't have that that clear opinion, and that's the that's the target for the Russian propaganda to influence those people who are not familiar with the the real situation, the real nature of the conflict. So and maybe this is also the question of the distance because. Geography matters, and uh, of course, it, it's it's good for the Balkans because this is a part of the Europe which is closer to to the Italy, Germany, Central Europe, and not to the Eastern Europe. So geographically, historically, even culturally, Balkans are connected with the European mainstream, not with the Vladivostok, let's say. But it also means that uh, this perspective uh, of of the uh, war in Ukraine, or to, to be more precise, this perspective uh, of this Russian aggression towards Ukraine can be a little bit influenced by the distance. And some people can can think or use this kind of you know, uh, simplifications created by the popular media. And um, among them, of course, there can be those, let's say, Russian narratives about how the West started the war in Ukraine. But uh, I, I see this... Uh, of course, of course, there are some uh, reasons to say that what I mentioned a few times today that some parts of the society are uh, are not supporting uh, Ukraine the the way in the way how would say Poland uh, supports Ukraine, but it doesn't mean that it's completely pro-Russian. I would not go with that. There are some parts of the society, but still uh, not the representation of the, of the foreign policy of the Balkan states, which are more. Uh, or, which are integrated into the European mainstream, those countries are candidates for the EU membership. Most of them are NATO members. It matters. This is the perspective. So, some of them uh, clearly support Ukraine, uh, not only politically, but also military. Uh, two days ago, it was the meeting of the Balkan states in Athens, uh, 20 years after the declaration in Sal- Sal- Thessaloniki. Uh, the Balkans are not integrated into the European Union to the way uh, we could expect after all those 20 years. But still, uh, the process going on and declaration signed at uh, in Thessaloniki uh, uh, says that those countries are supporting Ukraine, supporting Ukraine position. And among those countries, of course, it was also Serbia. And President Bush clearly said that Ukraine did nothing wrong to Serbia, and we support territorial integrity of Ukraine. And maybe we are not willing to criticize the other that much. And it would be kind of definition of Serbian foreign policy. But uh, maybe just just last sentence. I think that Russia is actually losing Bal- the, the Balkans. This influence, I see this that it's it's actually. Uh, mm, it, it's it's going down. Or it's plummeting. It's it. I think European future of the world's two Balkans is the main again agenda we support right now. And uh, keeping in mind those in, investments, this money promised by the European Union, just to keep the Balkans on tracks on track, let's say, just to keep the stability, peace, and the development in the region. I think Russia cannot offer anything uh, like that. So. I see that uh, actually Russia is losing losing the the Balkans in many different ways. And from the perspective of ordinary people, I would say, I think they are familiar. In many Balkan countries, I think that ordinary people just see those atrocities, crimes uh, committed by the Russian soldiers in the Ukraine. I think they understand the, the nature of the war crime, the nature of the war, the tragedy of war. This is the region which still remembers what the war is. So for that reason, many people in the Balkans are actually afraid of, of any particular intensification of conflicts. And they, maybe they don't love each other that much, Maybe, uh, but it doesn't mean that they want to start the serious conflicts, military conflict or next war in the Balkans. I think Russia will not be successful 
in in the in in trying to achieve that goal. I mean, this destabilization process is there, but it's not that effective as I think Russia would like to see this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, time is speeding fast. So it's time to thank uh, our uh, participants. I mean, uh, Professor Konrad Pawłowski, Dr. Jakub Olchowski, Dr. Andrzej Szaba Szabaciuk for your uh, very interesting uh, presentations uh, uh, and uh, uh, your perspectives on this uh, uh, problem. I mean, Russian disinformation and Russian propaganda. The insights provided by our esteemed panelists promise to shed light on the complex interplay and disinformation and geopolitical dyna dynamics uh, in, in the region. So thank you very much uh, uh, for your um, presentations and goodbye.